All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to my living room. <laughs> um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. So um, normally this is the um, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department's uh, Planetary Science and Astrobiology Seminar, but uh, in celebration of Titan Week and our Sea Star Distinguished Lecturer, who's here with us, Dr. Zibby Turtle, um, we thought that to, to kind of find uh, – Say goodbye to the semester. We'd have a really exciting panel today celebrating Dragonfly. So um, we're thrilled to have with us four members of the Dragonfly team. If you were on last night's lecture, you've already met Dr. Zibby Turtle, but we're going to go ahead and go around and let our panelists introduce themselves, what they do on the mission, and uh, give a little bit of background. And then we'll just open the floor up and have a great discussion for the next hour, hour and a half um, as as we have it. So thanks very much. We can start with. Um, uh, we'll we'll start things off with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Turtle. Thanks, Brittany. I'm going to put up a slide here. Um, we each made a bit of an introductory slide. Yeah. So I'm Zibby Turtle at the Applied Physics Laboratory. And I'm the principal investigator of Dragonfly. Uh, my background is primarily planetary geology, uh, impact cratering, studying uh, outer planet satellites in particular, uh, as well as studying Titan's weather. Um, and uh, in terms of, of planetary exploration, a combination of remote sensing and uh, geophysical modeling. Uh, so I've worked with the Europa Clipper, um, Mission, I'm the principal investigator for the Europa Imaging System for that. That's in development right now. Uh, and uh, I've also worked with the Cassini mission, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission, and the Galileo mission. And for, for Dragonfly, as principal investigator, my uh, primary role is to make sure that everything comes together so that we can achieve our science goals of understanding Titan's uh, prebiotic chemistry, um, and uh, the, the habitability of the Titan environment. And so, um, uh, so that's, that's my focus, is to look at the, the entire mission and make sure everything is, uh, is coming together uh, so that we can meet our... And I can turn it over to um, one of our deputy PIs, uh, Melissa Trainer, to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Um, I, give me one second to make sure I can do the screen sharing. Okay, can you guys see my slide? Yes. Great. Um, so, as I mentioned, I'm Melissa Trainer. I'm at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, here's a picture of me, I think, the day after the Dragonfly site visit. <laughs> um, <laughs> feeling, feeling calmer. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, a little relieved. Um, so as Zibby mentioned, one of my roles is as one of the deputy PIs on the mission. I'm working with um, Zibby and the other deputy PIs, uh, Jason Barnes, at University of Idaho, as well as the rest of the science and engineering team to make sure that Dragonfly can meet its science goals. I'm also the lead for the Dragonfly mass spectrometer, or DRAMS, um, which is one of the instruments on the Dragonfly payload. My background is in uh, planetary atmospheric chemistry uh, with a focus on organic synthesis. So I've spent um, many years doing laboratory studies looking at the synthesis of organic aerosol analogs, such as those that uh, might represent the haze particles and particles that are formed in Titan's atmosphere, as well as drawing parallels between that and what may have occurred on the Earth billions of years ago. And I also uh, in those studies, I've used a variety of techniques, but my main specialty is with uh, mass spectrometry, um, hence my role with the Dragonfly mass spectrometer. Uh, some experience that I've had, I'm on the MSL uh, SAM science team, looking um, primarily at in-situ studies of the Mars uh, atmosphere and atmosphere composition. Um, so I've studied uh, Mars atmospheres. I'm also very interested in uh, Venus atmosphere. Um, it's been 40 years since we've been in the Venus atmosphere and hoping someday to get more measurements from there. Uh, so one of my uh, big focuses um, in terms of the measurements that Dragonfly will make, uh, as well as um, the, in the development phase that we're in right now um, from the engineering side, is with the surface sampling. 
part of the Dragonfly mission. So this is uh, the Dragonfly mass spectrometer, or DRAMS, and the drill for acquisition of complex organics, or DRACO. Uh, when you put uh, these together, they comprise the, the in-situ sample measure the composition, the molecular composition, the Titan surface, uh, and to do so in, in different environments. Um, so to do that, we have uh, our DRAMS mass spectrometer that uses a variety of measurement modes to look at the chemical composition of surface samples that the Draco drills and, and delivers to us. And we're able to look at a wide mass range compared to, uh, for example, the SAM instrument that's flown before. And we also have the capability to look for uh, potential biosignatures, such as the chirality of molecules. Um, if we're able to uh, discover amino acids, for example, on Titan, we can look and see if there's an enantiomeric preference. Uh, so right now, most of my attention is, is spent on looking in, uh, on working on the development of the instrument to make sure that we meet all the science. So I think with that, I'll pass it along. I don't know if I'm, did I stop sharing? Yes. Okay. All right. So maybe since we're talking about instruments, I'll hand things off to, to Kristen. All right. Thank you. And... Apologies, I actually have to ask how to share my screen. I've never used BlueJeans before. There should be a sharing options on the side of your screen or at the bottom. It's on the right. Kristen, do you see the? It's on the. Doug, do you wanna do you wanna <laughs> jump in while I find the button? I can. Yeah. It's it's the just so you know, it's the one that looks like a little picture. It's the third third one up from the bottom oh, on the right. Is. You can. Okay. And Got you it. just. Okay, why don't you go ahead then, Kristen? Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm Kristen Thotson. Uh, I am the uh, deputy payload system engineer as well as the um, instrument scientist and the systems engineer for the uh, Dragonfly Geophysics and Meteorology Package, or DragMet. Um, so I'm, I have been working on uh, helping to develop the engineering plans and the requirements uh, for the DragMet instrument and also uh, trying to help shepherd the other instruments through the systems engineering process, so requirements development and interface development, um, instrument operations, and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I've historically been a space systems uh, analyst um, and uh, started moving into systems engineering um, uh, with the uh, deep space advanced radar concept as the mission systems engineer, and then uh, for Europa Clipper. Um, I worked on payload accommodations um, as part of the payload systems engineering team. Um, so, uh, but I'm also finishing up my PhD in uh, planetary science, and I've been focusing on planetary atmospheric spectroscopy and atmospheric processes. Um, so, uh, which is why I've been working on the, the DragMet instrument. Uh, so the DragMet payload, just a quick overview, um, Melissa, Melissa already uh, mentioned uh, DRAMS and DRACO, the mass spectrometer, and the, uh, the drill for acquisition of complex organics, and those two work together to, to do the, um, the higher resolution mass spectrometry for Dragonfly. And then we also have uh, DRAGON, the gamma ray neutron spectrometer, which gives us more uh, um, a uh, look at the bulk composition of the uh, surface and uh, near subsurface um, at the landing sites. And then we have the geophysics and meteorology package, uh, which I mentioned, uh, which is looking at uh, atmospheric processes and uh, properties like temperature and pressure and hydrogen abundance and methane, um, methane abundance, uh, and humidity to examine the methane cycle. Um, and we also have some uh, geophones and a seismometer, uh, so we can um, listen for uh, titan quakes and uh, subsurface activity, um, as well as measure uh, surface properties 
um, of the of the soil at the landing site. Um, and then we also have Dragon Cam, which is a camera suite um, that includes uh, panor panorama cameras, which are the ones on the high gain antenna here, um, as well as uh, cameras that examine the surface in front of and underneath the lander and uh, microscopic uh, cameras that really focus in on the, the drilling sites so that we can get a, a good visual of, of what we're what we're actually drilling and collecting and sending to, to DRAMS and DRACO. Um, and so the, for the systems engineering roles, um, the systems engineers really focus on uh, making sure that everything is uh, connected properly and that we're meeting all of the, the science requirements and uh, looking at uh, performing all the integration and testing as well as operations design uh, for the instruments to make sure that we can, um, that when we, when we get to Titan, we can uh, perform the science and achieve our, our science goals and objectives and also return, return all the data and that everything is working properly um, so that we can, we can get as much data and as much valuable science as possible out of the mission. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to Doug. All right, um, so I will do the same. I'll share a little brief background about myself. I hope this is coming through, it says it is. So uh, the left is a, a photo taken at our first team meeting after the win, and that was a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we were very excited to win uh, Dragonfly. Uh, we forget that it was a competed mission, and that was a, a large part of um, large part of our lives for a number of years. So I'm Doug Adams. I am the Dragonfly flight system engineer. Uh, I also noted that, you know, I architect and chief engineer. So one of my chief uh, responsibilities is to put together a system, a, a flight system, an engineering system that will achieve all of the science objectives that uh, Zibby, Melissa, and Kristen have discussed. And uh, that includes accommodating the science instru instruments, but also um, executing the science mission, both getting to Titan and then uh, on the surface of Titan. So my background, uh, I spent uh, 12 years at JPL and then uh, the subsequent uh, aid have been at, at APL. And I, I principally worked on planetary landers, um, but I also worked on a couple other spacecraft, uh, a number of, of the deep space exploration uh, robotic spacecraft. A lot of what I did was uh, in the EDL world, the entry, descent, and landing technologies, and uh, that's where I, I got to apply. I was a little bit fortunate in um, how things came together. I got my PhD in applied mechanics uh, and dynamics, and that was kind of just a natural place for me to settle out, and and, uh, and I've had a good career doing it. Uh, so some of the things I've worked on, uh, I started, I cut my teeth on the, on the MER program, Spirit and Opportunity Rovers, that had a, a long life on Mars. Uh, moved from there to the Phoenix lander. Uh, I was the EDL mechanical systems for Phoenix. Um, followed that with being the uh, role of cognizant engineer for the parachute on the Curiosity rover that uh, is still driving around on Mars today. Uh, did a stint as the uh, Balut cognizant engineer for the LDSD program, which is an interesting problem if you want to talk about that. And I was also the dynamics lead for uh, SMAP which was a earth orbiting platform, a very challenging uh, dynamics uh, problem we had there. Uh, the only thing, I'll, I'll just throw this up. Uh, Zibi um, talked about this last night and you've seen uh, some of this from, um, some of this material from Melissa and Kristen as well. But this is, if you will, this is the flight system. You know, the flight system is that which flies in space. And we have to get to Titan, so we launch on a rocket, of course, uh, and we have a, a cruise. Uh, it takes us, it depends on the launch vehicle that we get, but uh, it takes us something on the order of eight years uh, uh, to get to Titan, uh, again, depending on the rocket. Uh, we're spin stabilized, that's why you see the circular um, cruise stage and, and the axisymmetric uh, body, so we have oblate inertia properties in space, uh, very much like um, MSL and, and, and now the, um, Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover that's on its way to Mars is going to land in February. Uh, was uh, they're also spin balanced. Uh, we do uh, hypersonic atmospheric entry, 
uh, descent and landing. It takes us about two and a half hours to get down through the atmosphere. And then on the surface, uh, we do a transition to powered flight. And what you see on the right is our lander. It's an X8 configuration. So we say that because it has eight rotors as opposed to an octagon configuration for the eight. It's a rectangular configuration for the eight and they're stacked. That's for redundancy. So if we lose one, we can keep flying with the other seven. Uh, the, and the only other thing I'll mention real quick is that, uh, actually, I guess two things. One is that this this is big. This is not a daughter craft or something. It's approximately 12 feet wide and, and again, about 12 feet long and about five feet high. And the thing you see on the back, that, that cylinder you see on the back uh, houses an MMRTG, uh, which is our proposed power source that uh, is the same power source that is used for MSL and uh, and the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Uh, we use it, though, to keep ourselves warm in the uh, 94 Kelvin or minus 179 C atmosphere of Titan. And I think with that, I'll just stop because we can um, go to other Q&A. So uh, thanks and uh, take it away, Brittany. Yeah, that was that was really great. Thanks so much for the introduction, folks. So um i'll turn it over so uh just a reminder to everyone watching there's a chat we've got a poll um uh that's going uh we've asked if the dragonfly suit that doug was just showing uh himself wearing is the best they've that you've ever seen um or whether you've already ordered it from amazon and not sponsored by amazon in any way um and then uh let's let's have some questions so uh, the students from the uh, from the class are um, uh, they are um, able to ask questions. So and then if there's uh, anyone who's an attendee and wants to ask a question, just post it in the Q&A section uh, down at the bottom. So um, with that, uh, let's go to um, so uh, folks who are presenters, if you just want to um, raise your hand. Um, or uh, unmute and ask a question, that would be great. So have at it. I will take the first question if no one minds. Nice, go for it, Chase. So uh, Dr. Turtle, you mentioned last night about the sampling system, how you're going to have to take into account, obviously, what kind of things you're gonna sample as in this organic sand. Um, I'm curious of what kind of analogs you're considering, uh, maybe more specifics if you have them, but also like what kind, what we expect them to be. Do we expect them to be kind of like sticky or something that might sort of gum up the works of the sampling system? Yeah, so ex that's exactly, um, that's exactly what we need to pay attention to. Could things be, uh, sticky, uh, um, uh, and not not so much the system, but you know, be stuck in the system so that you get you measure the same material, at, and you know, you get to a new landing site, um, and you're sampling new material, but you still have some of the old material in there, and so that's one of the things that um, uh, that Melissa needs to to pay attention to in terms of the contamination control and how we how we make sure we understand which materials come from which part of the surface. So we make sure, want to make sure we don't have things that get stuck inside the system, as you say. Uh, so there are a number of different things that can be um, used as good analogs. One of the one of the materials that's been used is sand and oil mixed together um, because that's uh, definitely sticky. And they did a lot of testing of the sampling system. Uh, and the opening into the pneumatic uh, system uh, and then the, the system itself. Uh, another um, analog that's been used is crushed walnut shells, actually, and they've just been using that uh, actually the last couple weeks here at APL uh, in uh, our new uh, test facility uh, that uh, matches aspects of the Titan environment. Um, so uh, yeah, so they're they're a wide variety of material. We have I can't remember the number. Maybe you do the the Draco team uh, tested um, in phase A, but we have this big matrix of like 20 different types of materials and combinations uh, to look exactly at that kind of thing. What's the most effective uh, sampling system um, to get the material in, and then how do we make sure we don't have uh, you know cross contamination, et cetera. Huh. 
Hi, um, my name is Ashley Hanna. Thank you so much for having this panel. Um, my question is geared towards the mass spec, and I kind of wanted to know what your um, thoughts were on why you chose the mass range. Um, why did you decide to go with two modes of um, uh, analysis, so LDMS and DC, and then also as a follow-up, your GC is able to do chiral analysis, and I kind of wanted to know about how you plan on doing that. Okay, so I'm just gonna make sure I answer all these questions. Why mass spec, why two modes, how do we do chiral? <laughs> um, so for the first question, um, what we wanted to do when we were planning the mission is to take uh, hardware uh, instrumentation that's been proven out in, in other uh, environments and other planetary exploration and, and then adapt it to go to Titan, right? We didn't want to pick uh, a completely brand new, untested, a uh, type of instrumentation um, because we're sending a drone to Titan and there's plenty of other challenges in there, right? So we wanted to, to kind of build on work that's already been done with the mass spectrometer, uh, space flight mass spectrometer community. So we are, the mass spec that we're using, it's an ion trap mass spectrometer and it's uh, based off of two, two instruments that have been developed for flight uh, for Mars. So one is the, um, Mars Organic uh, Molecule Analyzer, or MoMA, and that's actually, it's been fully qualified and it's ready to fly on the ExoMars rover, which is getting launched in 2022. And we also have a lot of heritage, though, coming out of the sample analysis at Mars, or, or SAM instrument that's on MSL and has been operating on MSL for, for years and years. Um, what is the two modes that I mentioned and that you asked about? Um, are uh, unique in particular to the MoMA architecture, uh, which is the ion trap. And the reason we wanted to choose that is because we know that Titan is going to have uh, diverse types of surface materials. We're looking at, for example, we talked a little bit about our, the organic sands that we expect to measure. We think these are really complex organic molecules. Uh, based on what we understand from measurements at Titan, as well as the types of laboratory simulations uh, that are done, we expect them to range uh, in very high molecular weights. And the laser desorption mass spec mode in particular is um, very good at looking at high molecular weight compounds because you're not relying on them having uh, volatility necessarily. You're using the energy of the laser, you just put the sample right in front, you shoot it with the laser, and uh, you have this combination desorption ionization step that can turn even very large molecules into ions that focus into the mass spec and then be able to measure them. And so the, that laser desorption capability allows us to uh, look at sort of higher molecular weight compounds that we think we're going to find there just based on everything we know about Titan chemistry. And it also lets us do that with sort of what I would call like minimal processing of the sample. Um, we don't have to heat it. We don't have to do other sample processing things. We do have to collect it and deliver it in front of the mass spec and, and then the laser probe the surface. So that's, that's why we want that mode, but then we wanted to be able to do um, an additional sort of separation step and a little bit more selective measurements. And, and, and in a way that has been done, again, previously on other missions that have been looking for organic uh, compounds. And so that's where the gas photography mode comes in, or GC. And that allows us to add that additional step when the molecules go through the GC. They travel through and they get separated out based on size and chemical functionality before going into the mass spec. And so it helps us kind of take what we expect to be a, a complex mixture and, and sort of sort everything out in a way where we can do uh, a really definitive uh, identification of, of some of the molecules that are going to be found in the surface. Um, and so with those two complementary modes, it, it really helps us kind of get at, at all the aspects of the composition that we're going to tighten. Um, the way the chiral measurement works is that we have a column that is, uh, the, it has what's called the stationary phase that coats the column, it is able to separate out enantiomers uh, so, for example, for does, uh, different amino acids, as I mentioned, that is um, one of our target molecules, uh, the column has the ability to separate out the left and right-handed uh, uh, molecules from, from those from each other, just based on the interactions with the stationary phase. So, 
if we are, um, if we find amino acids on, on tightened surface using the GC mode, the first step we have is called derivatization. This is something that helps uh, change the chemical functionality of the molecules to, to liberate them um, so that they can get into the gas flow. So they sort of uh, uh, increase their volatility. And then they go through the chiral column and, and they get separated out. And then we can see if you have a lot more uh, left-handed or a lot more right-handed or if they're approximately equal, which is what we expect to find um, in, in the abiotic systems. All right, I talked a lot, but I think I hit all three of your questions, Ashley. Yes, that was great. I guess my last follow-up really quickly is, do you have any fears about decomposition through the pyrolysis um, of those like amino acids, like larger amino acids? Yeah, so I, the amino acids, I'm, I'm not as concerned because that's, the derivatization step that we use is, is really optimized to prevent that kind of um, decomposition. So uh, we are, most of our GC cups will have this like preloaded uh, chemical reagent in a, in a little capsule. And once we get, it gets to a certain temperature in the oven, uh, it opens up, mixes the derivatization agent with the amino acids and it, and it changes, it replaces some of the functional groups. As I said, that makes it a lot easier for them to get into the gas flow. So this is something that's been done. It's done repeated, you know, uh, commonly in the laboratory. It's on the SAM instrument, and it's also going on the, the MoMA instrument. So this is something that, that has been sort of proven out as, as a good approach. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll take a second here just to ask a question that I thought was, was great from the Q&A. Um, so let me just get that open. And it was, um, uh, let's see, it was actually one of Josh Dooley's questions. Um, and it was about the pipeline. Oh yeah, my daily robotic work uses computer vision for pose estimation and localization. Can you explain a little bit about the perception pipeline and methods or algorithms that will be used to estimate pose and localize Dragonfly? Um, wondering if it works with feature detection or something more experimental. So um, I'll ask a question when he says pose. So I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain I understand what what the question is. Is oh, this yeah, about optical navigation? Attitude, basically, like how are you controlling for? Um, I know everyone uses slightly different terms depending on what field you work in. So the idea is, you know, with uh, with underwater robotic systems is what you know is one of the ways that we use it where you try to look at the changing perspective on a feature to, to estimate how your vehicle is positioned. And so we were just wondering how, how does Dragonfly control attitude or know that it's got the right attitude? Um, and does it use anything that's visual? Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, now I understand, thank you for the explanation. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, we have a, a number of sensors, and I don't have my slide handy that, that talks through all of them, but I'll just mention briefly the, the, the way this comes together. So we have a um, an extended Kalman filter that we use to propagate our navigated uh, knowledge, both position and or and state vector of the vehicle. Um, and the um, we use optical navigation, optical odometry, really, uh, to establish uh, our relative position as we move across the surface. And also to find our way back, we use a, a technique uh, we call breadcrumbs, where we store images that we, we wish to read in order to retrace our steps. Regarding the attitude of the vehicle specifically, though, that's tracked with, a, with an IMU. We integrate uh, the orientation of the vehicle with an IMU. Uh, we actually use a, a Honeywell MIMU, which is a very precise um, scientific grade uh, IMU. Uh, the interesting part that I'll add to that, though, is that uh, we we don't have a really good way of initializing IMU once we're on the surface, because from Titan's surface, you can't see the stars. You can barely see the sun. It kind of shows up as a big blob in the sky uh, due to the, due the uh, diffusivity of the atmosphere. So what we have to do is we have to uh, do a kind of a an approximate local estimate of our initial attitude where we... Um, we do a gyro compass before we take off to estimate where north is. And of course, we can sense gravity with the accelerometers. And we, do, we use that as an initial state. But the question is very good because, in fact, what we do is as soon as we take off from the ground, 
we start to use the previous images we took and in fact the the image to image sequences as we take off from the ground to correct for yaw errors because it's very difficult there's no magnetic field on titan so we don't know where north is and we have to be able to re uh, remove the yaw error in order to establish uh, our ability to, to tra retrace those uh, breadcrumbs that I mentioned earlier. So in fact, the, the, uh, we do use optical uh, techniques, both for initialization of our state uh, or correction of the initialization of the state and for our navigation on the surface. And um, I think that answers the question, but if I missed yeah. it, please let me know. That's great. It's actually, um, I wanted to ask that too, because uh, it is the same problem that we have when we do under ice work. So we we put a robot with an IMU initial that wants to be horizontal, but we have to get it vertical to go through to go through the ice. When you get out underneath, then it's anybody's best guess. Plus, we're at, you know at the South Pole where the magnetic field is, shall we say, not particularly cooperative. So trying to it's it's that's that made me really excited that we're basically navigating on Titan. Uh, <laughs> so that's really exciting. Yeah, um, it's uh, actually it's uh, I would say it's very similar uh, based on your description. Yes, that's cool. Hi all. Uh, I had a tangentially related navigation question. When you're in flight, does any of the science data or is any of the instrumentation active in terms of selecting the next landing site, or is all sort of pre-selected based on engineering safety? So. I'm going to let Zibi give an answer too, but I'll give you a quick one, which is um, we have dedicated engineering cameras, uh, nav cams. There are two of them, um, and those are used. They're panchromatic cameras that are used uh, specifically, uh, specifically for their ability to take uh, high shutter speed, sharp images that we can use for for navigation. Um, and we use those cameras to survey future landing sites. Um, there's a leapfrog technique that I could get into. I think Zibi may have talked about that yesterday. But uh, the nav cams are our primary source of information for um, scouting future landing sites, for inspecting future potential landing sites. Uh, however, uh, we do take science images when we fly. We use both the forward and down cameras at different points when we're flying. Um, and maybe Zibi, if you want to comment on that, uh, please feel free. Sure. Yeah. So we'll we'll take um, measurements in flight um, along, we'll, and we'll take um, images uh, as we're flying. Um, we'll actually initially just play back thumbnails, um, but we'll we'll keep the data on board so that uh, we can select any particularly interesting images to play back at higher resolution. Um, but yeah, as, as Doug says, we have this leapfrog strategy uh, where we actually go out and scout uh, future landing sites before we come back to a previously scouted landing site. Um, and this this allows us to look ahead both, as you say, from the avoidance perspective and landing site safety perspective, but also to do imaging with the various cameras to uh, look ahead at the potential landing sites in terms of the, um, the scientific uh, opportunities that we may have at those landing sites. Um, in particular, um, what we will do is identify, we'll, we'll scout a landing zone, which is a bigger area than, the, than the, the lander itself. And then we will target within that zone, we will uh, target specific areas of interest as target landing sites. Uh, but ultimately, the uh, determination of the safe landing site and the best place to land is left up to Dragonfly, which does that autonomously. So we will provide the guidance based on what we see, um, and then uh, Dragonfly will select the, the best place within the, the landing zone that we target. I'll just jump in real quick and add that uh, we will also be uh, also have some of the DragMet sensors active while we're flying so that we can collect uh, data on the temperature profiles and uh, methane humidity profiles and that kind of thing. It's not relevant exactly to the mobility system, but the, it is still science data that we'll be collecting in flight. 
And I'll add to what Kristen said, which is one of our science requirements is to be able to do atmospheric profiles. We have to fly to uh, from the surface to three and a half kilometers above the surface to do the same uh, using the dragnet sensors. So we don't talk about that a lot, but that's one of our uh, key requirements as well. That's great. Thank you. I had a question um, for anybody could answer this. I think Zibby kind of answered this yesterday, but um, I was interested in learning how you guys basically like how you got to where you are today um, and any advice you could give grad students and, and basically how you um, got, got the opportunity to work on this mission. Um, so since I spoke to that last night, um, I'd like to defer right now to others. Um, I'm happy to uh, to provide more information, but um, in the interest of time, uh, let's. Uh, I'd like to let others speak as well. Um, I'll just jump in real quick, but also I'm sure Kristen and Doug can can add. Um, for me, uh, it wasn't. Uh, necessarily a, a planned path to get to be a scientist at, at NASA. Um, I, probably like many of you, I liked science and math in school, so I kept doing it as long as they let me, pretty much. Um, went to grad school because I wanted to keep going to school because I loved learning and, and loved uh, the, the research environment um, and was uh, looking around for projects in graduate school, found atmospheric chemistry very interesting, and then and then it turned out the project that was available was planetary atmospheric chemistry, studying Titan, and that's when I fell in love with Titan and and early Earth, um, uh, and I, a lot of the way that I describe my career path is kind of saying yes to things that you didn't necessarily expect as opportunities, uh, but they but they come along and 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 you take the chance. So after doing my um, graduate research. I'm finishing my PhD and I've started a postdoc. This this job opportunity at Goddard came along to work um, in a, a group that makes mass spectrometers. I had used mass spectrometers in my research, but I um, didn't necessarily know how to build them. Uh, but they were looking for scientists, uh, you know, who are uh, using mass specs for planetary research. And I had um, didn't know much about the job. I had been planning to do something totally different with my career, you know, faculty jobs. Uh, but I said, well, sure, uh, you know, let me check it out, let me visit it, um, and uh, ended up joining the, the group at, at Goddard, and, and from there I was lucky enough to, to be in an environment where mission support is a big part, and, and so that has exposed me to a lot of opportunities um, that I may not have necessarily had um, if, I had, if I had stayed in sort of a, a research-only focused uh, opportunity. Um, and 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 so then being being kind of where I am, I started working with uh, Zippy back on the Titan Mare Explorer time many many years ago. Previous proposal, and I think I even saw some Q and A about that. Um, and then and then usually once you start to meet people and you work with them, um, you uh, find find groups of people that are really good to work with to help you accomplish kind of some of the goals that you have in 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 science and in exploration. And I find that a lot of uh, mission, a lot of mission work, you end up uh, seeking out the people that you know um, are, are good team members, are good teammates, do do the best work, but also are good to work with. So, I don't know how helpful of an answer that was, so I'm going to let Kristen and Doug <laughs> chime in too. You go ahead, Kristen. Um, so I think uh, for I'll echo a couple of things that uh, that Melissa said. Um, uh, completely agree with uh, being open to opportunities that uh, that maybe you didn't think were on your career path, um, but uh, but if it's a, an opportunity to work with uh, a really cool concept or or even with just with a really good team, um, those can. Uh, those can be good things to, to follow up on. I will say that I speak from personal experience and that one needs to be a little careful about saying yes to everything um, because that can 
and I notice all three of our of our other presenters are nodding their heads. Um, but uh, but yeah, because uh, that can that can lead to burnout, um, but it can also lead to a lot of really cool opportunities. So, um, and for me in particular, uh, I had the opportunity to work on the Titan Mari Explorer um, back many moons ago, um, uh, primarily with uh, Ralph Lorenz, who is the mission architect for Dragonfly. Um, and so, and then built on my, uh, my systems engineering experience um, with a couple other mission concepts and uh, particularly with Europa Clipper. Um, and so working with the instruments and learning about how they work and uh, how they interface to the, to the spacecraft and what the different needs are. Um, and so when Dragonfly was looking for um, payload systems engineers, I was uh, well positioned because of those roles um, and also because I'm uh, been working on my PhD in planetary science, having the, the science background um, and the engineering background is a, a good combination for, for the systems engineering because those are the people who have to kind of translate between the science and the engineering and make sure that and try to keep both sides happy <laughs> um, as much as we can. So. All right, so I'll I'll go um, last, uh, and unsurprisingly, and I'll, I'll try to minimize the repetition, but unsurprisingly, you'll see some common threads as well. Uh, I'll I'll go back just a little bit to um, I, I co-opted Johnson Space Center as an undergrad and master's student. I think I even did a tour uh, before my the start of my PhD program. So I always kind of thought I would do manned spaceflight stuff. Um, but then I was in school, you know, I was in school for a long time doing a PhD program. And when it came time to get out, uh, I kind of surveyed what my options were. And I liked space. I wanted to do something in space. And, you know, they were staffing for the Mars Exploration Rovers at the time. And and they uh, recruited me to to come to JPL and work on that. And And like Melissa said, and echoed by Kristen, I had never really thought that much. Again, I had kind of a manned spacecraft background. I thought, well, Okay, let's let's do it. Let's see what happens. And it turned out to be a marvelous experience. I, and, and my, you know, it was kind of the spark. Everything just kind of blew up from there. You know, it was the perfect fit. And and um, and then, I, as I mentioned earlier, I had this kind of series of of missions that just kind of went back to back to back, and one kind of fed into the other. And uh, but but then uh, to get to Dragonfly, though, um, we made a family move to the East Coast, and I joined APL. And when I did that, I made a conscious decision. You know, I had always worked on the missions, and this time I wanted to be one of the people that was developing or kind of architecting. I use the word arch architect, architecting the mission so that I could solve the problems before they became problems. And so I kind of made that career switch when I came to APL, and I started doing uh, a lot of proposal work. I worked on a number of proposals, Discovery and, and New Frontiers proposals which is something I never really thought I would do, but it turned out I really liked that because it gave me the, the uh, application for all these all this knowledge that I'd kind of accumulated. Uh, and then one day, and I'll use Ralph's name again, it was mentioned earlier, uh, I was called into an office and, and Ralph sat on one side of the table and Ken and I sat there with Cheryl Reed. And, and so we had this kind of crazy idea. We want to put this octocopter on Titan or actually uh, they said quadcopter at the time. And, and we all kind of looked around at the table and said, well, we think we can do it and you know, here we are today. It was it was a Herculean task. I I cannot understate, uh, you know, or cannot overstate that is how much work we put into it. Uh, it was a work to exhaustion experience. But uh, that that's the the path. As I start, I kind of just I didn't expect to be in robotic space when I was in school, and then I ended up there. And I like Melissa said, I kind of just followed the opportunities as it came along. And Dragonfly, we had lightning in a bottle with that one, and so we all put our shoulder into it and. We're here talking today. Thank you all for answering that. That was, that was awesome. Um, I'll quickly ask a question that's been on there for a while. So um, this is from Aaron Patel. Um, uh, I'm curious about the organic sand on Titan. Is there a danger of any electrical, uh, electrically isolated building up charge during flights? Um, or uh, electrostatically collecting airborne material, and is there a means of grounding it or clearing anything or any accretion uh, on the vehicle or or on camera lenses or something like that? Who wants to take that one? 
I was going to tell Kristen. Doug, I can, I can start. And okay, go, go, go. Doug, do you want to finish it? Um, okay, so uh, I'll talk from the payload perspective, and then Doug can can speak to the the lander perspective. Um, so we do have that is something that we have been thinking about, and we do have uh, requirements for the instruments to um, to be able to uh, mitigate the impact of um, of accreted material and uh, airborne dust and that kind of thing. Um, it is something that we have been thinking about a lot for the, the camera lenses in particular, and we have a, a trade study going for that to figure out the best way to um, either prevent accretion or remove it. Um, so, and then, but uh, interestingly, we actually have uh, one of the instruments on DragMet is, um, it's a, an electric field antenna that uh, is going to be looking to measure the uh, the change in the electric field and the charge buildup um, when when the rotors are are blowing actually so uh, so it is something we're thinking about and we, it's actually something we we hope to measure as well as 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 well as mitigate detrimental effects um, and the instruments have to be grounded to the lander and then the lander I, is uh, I'm sure has a grounding scheme to make sure that uh, uh, that there's no uh, rapid charge dissipation. Um, so I'll let, I'll let Doug speak to that if he wants to. I, I'll comment just briefly on it. Uh, we were aware of the risk of static charge uh, when we, even in the, the proposal phase, um, to the point where we had described having, if you've flown on planes and never noticed, you'll see these little fingers kind of sticking out near the, the wingtips. Uh, on the trailing edge of the wing. Those are static wicks that are designed to bleed off static charge in the same way that a lightning rod would uh, here on Earth. We went so far as to even include static wicks on the rotors and on the body of the lander. Um, the interesting thing about that though is because there's no water in the atmosphere, there's no ions, so you actually have to bring your own ion supply. Uh, and we discussed whether or not there are merits in doing that. And uh, to be honest, right now, we don't have a, a fully uh, architected solution for exactly what we think we're going to fly to to mitigate that. But having said that, as as Kristen described, we, we do currently plan to have the entire ex, uh, exoskeleton of the lander be a conductive surface so that, you you know, you don't have some big static buildup in some place that could arc and cause a problem. Uh, we are keenly aware of the, the risks of, of uh, building up a static charge, and, and we are planning to have uh, grounding straps and uh, measures in place to mitigate that. Kristen, I think we stunned them into silence. I'm not hearing anything. Uh, um, I'll, ask you, uh, I'll ask you a quick question. Um, uh, is the direct to earth uh, telecom system XBand KA or both? Yeah, that's a quick one to answer. It's a XBand. We have a 100 watt XBand uh, transmitter. Uh, we considered KA. Uh, there are a couple reasons we didn't fly that. One is that we don't really have the, the mass and volume to accommodate two different uh, bandwidths. Uh, the antennas are very different. At least uh, it's challenging to do dual band X and KA. It can be done, uh, but uh, we didn't. We needed to avoid complications. So um, the other thing is X band transmits through the Titan atmosphere in a rather happy way. Uh, so it's it simplifies uh, our overall because you, you really KA is designed for downlink only, and you need X band for uplink. So um, it's uh, it's much simpler for us to have a single band, and we use X band is the answer. Okay, great. Um, question about the development uh, for Dragonfly mission development timescale. How did the uh, Titan Mare Explorer and other proposed missions influence Dragonfly's development? And is there anything that you wish you could have included on Dragonfly that had to be cut? Um, let's see, I can take, uh, I can certainly speak to, to part of that. Um, the, uh, there are a lot of aspects of the, the, um, 
Titan environment and planning for exploration of the Titan environment uh, that had been developed as part of the Titan Mare Explorer proposal um, that we could uh, leverage into the, the um, design and the environmental uh, assessments for Dragonfly. Obviously, the Titan Mare Explorer um, which was designed to send a probe to float on one of the northern seas at Titan, has a substantial number of differences as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, entering the atmosphere, in terms of uh, functioning on the surface at 94 Kelvin, there were a lot of, um, a lot of aspects of that uh, that we were able to, uh, um, uh, to um, take advantage of. Um, and uh, I'm sure Melissa can speak uh, more specifically to some of the work that was done uh, uh, related to the, the mass spectrometer. Um, quick, uh, very quickly related to are there things we, we wish we could take with us uh, that we are not there? There are always things one can think of adding to, um, you know, adding to a mission. There are always uh, different uh, instruments or uh, capabilities uh, that, that one would like to add. Um, I think we have a, a, a good solid a set of complementary measurements, uh, and so I'm trying to, you know, keep focused on that, uh, making sure everything that we have, uh, you know, continues to, to fit together and uh, work within the, the resources we have, but I, I'm sure each of us could list a number of things we'd like to add as well. Uh, Melissa, I don't know if there's anything specific to the, the mass spectrometer um, sure. from certainly... the evolution of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we what we have on Dragonfly has ended up being quite different than the mass spec that we were thinking of uh, for time. Partly because with time, what the goal was, was to ingest the C sample um, and make a quantitative measurement of the relative proportions of things like methane, ethane, propane, and some of the, the trace compounds, but we we had this really big technology development to develop what that inlet would be. So you're trying to think of how do I design an inlet that can safely ingest, uh, you know, a 90 Kelvin liquid, but then encapsulate it and then heat it up to much higher temperatures and send it to an instrument. So um, what I would say is there's a lot of uh, learning that we did there relative to uh, materials relative to thinking how to function with these gigantic temperature gradients and these big temperature uh, swings, kind of, um, and and how that can all couple from an environment into, you know, the, the instrument that has to be held at a particular pressure to operate properly, uh, things like that. So there's a lot that we learned in that process that why it's not directly relevant. We don't have that liquid inlet, you know, for that we have a very different surface sampling system for solids. Um, but a lot of that work translated. So, and a lot of the, some of the people who worked on on that particular project, like some of the cryogenic engineers, are the same cryogenic engineers that are helping us now figure out how do we keep our sample cold while we do LDMS on it. So, so a lot of times what happens too is just the people the people help help carry you into challenge. Uh, I have a question. I'm Shinmai. Uh, I work on impact emissions to icy worlds, so I think that was a really good uh, place for me to ask my question. How straightforward is the technology transfer from Dragonfly to something like uh, Europa or Enceladus flyby or a lander mission? Of course, I understand that the sample collection is going to be different, but what about the analytical instrumentation transfer-wise? I can, I'll take a short answer at that and, and then see if anyone wants to talk about it. Um, there's a lot that's that's in common. There's a lot of developments that are happening all sort of in parallel. So at the same time that we were putting together our concept for DRAMS, for the Dragonfly Mass Spectrometer, we um, uh, had in our group another effort looking at how to develop uh, mass spectrometers for Europa Lander. For example, in fact, um, Will Brinkerhoff, who is uh, the deputy lead on DRAMS and a co-I on Dragonfly, is, is the PI of, of an effort to develop a, a similar mass spectrometer with some differences, though, that can operate on the, the surface of Europa. So there's some parallels there in thinking through how you do the automated um, GC or LDMS on, on samples that might have, um, for example, an ice component or come from a very cold environment. 
Uh, but then there's also going to be big differences, right? So the big challenge in Europa for a lot of what we're trying to do is the radiation environment and thinking that through um, as well as maybe uh, the power limitations. Or and time, <laughs> You're, you you have to operate much much quicker before you perish. Um, the big challenge in Titan, one of the big challenges is in addition to the temperature, we also have this big atmosphere, which is for a mass spectrometer something you want to usually get rid of when you're doing your your measurement inside the sensor. And so so it's it's um, uh, every time we do a new development, every time we're able to prove out hardware that can work, it, it it absolutely can transfer. To, to other environments. Um, but then the fun of it is every, not just every target we go to, but every like architecture change is ends up being unique, right? Um, and so that's where all the fun comes in. And that's why this work is like so super customized. Every instrument's a little different. At least for the kind of stuff I do. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, there was a question that also came up last night, um, but it was I, I, well, we were talked a little bit about EDL. Um, but uh, one of the questions was, uh, why is it a direct Titan insertion instead of using something like Saturn error capture, error breaking, or something like that? Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's interesting to think about how you could do it. You know, you could even do a, an uh, aero capture and then entry uh, at Titan as well. Of course, you could hit the atmosphere there. Um, the the harsh reality is, is that it comes down to uh, costs. Uh, we we just don't have the money uh, in the budget for a, a competed mission to do anything more than we must when it comes to uh, technologies. It, it, you have to th you have to remember EDL is a means to an end. It's how we get to the surface. It's not actually the science mission. So. We have to achieve that as efficiently as possible. And a direct entry is extremely efficient. Uh, you hit the atmosphere, uh, it makes good use of the ablative materials, um, and it gets you down to the surface uh, with, with minimum hardware and, and minimum effort to do. So that, that's the real reason why we don't do something. Because you could imagine you could use one of these deployables or something to, to have a very low ballistic coefficient entry that would be very low G. And yes, it could be done, but the, again, it, those are additional complications that we just can't afford, which actually I'm gonna use that briefly for a quick segue to the what we wish we had. Um, one thing that would be super nice, which also violated the cost problem, uh, it would really be nice to have an orbiting asset that we could transmit data up to to relay to Earth. In fact, I actually went so far as to even catch up in PowerPoint what it might look like to launch something like that. And we showed it at a meeting in West 202 and, and we all looked at it and every single one of us said, yeah, that's flagship. We can't do that. <laughs> so it, it made it to the cutting room floor pretty quickly. But that's that's a, an example, uh, not, not unlike the EDL question where you just have to make choices to fit within the box. Uh, so Catherine, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Brittany. I had a follow-up question on that data transfer issue. That seems to be common across a lot of missions in the Europa lander. Uh, SCT team also had some challenges and scope issues with an orbital data relay. Is there a long-term solution for that, or are people working on a way of easing that problem? This is a little bit more general, but it seems like Dragonfly also had that problem. I'll give you a quick answer. Um, you know, the the quick answer is that we would all very much like the deep space network to keep the 70 meter assets in play uh, because having those 70 meter apertures makes a huge difference in terms of being able to downlink data. Um, arraying 34s can duplicate that, but then you're committing the whole complex uh, assets uh, for what one aperture could do. So that's thing one is to have a, a good earth aperture. Um, in situ, though, it becomes a case-by-case -case basis. You know, for Europa, uh, I also worked the Europa Lander. Uh, I was on the Europa Lander team at APL, and um, the original plan was to leave the carrier spacecraft in orbit to act as a relay space uh, relay. Uh, of course, at Europa, the problem there is the radiation environment is so intense that you can't expect anything to last long uh, on the surface or in orbit. Um, 
Titan would be different. You could have something that could last a long time there, but uh, it would be very specific again to the mission. You know, there aren't that many missions at Titan. It's an outer planet. It's hard to get to. So Mars is unique because it's very close, uh, very, very relatively straightforward to get to, and there are a lot of orbiting assets. So I think that I, I'll leave it at that. I think the challenge is the mission specific challenge. Uh, from but f again, from a NASA support perspective, the, the bigger the aperture, the better for downlink. So, Catherine Nudell, I know you had a question. Did you want to ask yours? Yeah, um, I was wondering about the seismometers and what you guys might expect to find and what you think might cause what you find. Um, so I can I can start this one off and then uh, and then if the bee wants to fill in, we can do that. Um, so uh, so we want to take some seismometers to Titan because we um, we actually don't really know what the internal structure of not just Titan but uh, most icy bodies uh, looks like. Um, so, uh, so we want to, and, uh, we think that the main source of seismic activity on Titan would be, uh, tidal forces from Saturn. Um, so we, uh, but since we don't know what the internal structure, uh, of Titan looks like, we don't know exactly what that tidal forcing, uh, what the effects of it would be. Um, so if we want to take the seismometers so that we can listen for, uh, for seismic activity, uh, how often do we see signals and how strong are they? Um, and uh, that will give us an idea of, uh, or at least start to give us an idea of what the what the internal structure of uh, Titan might look like um, and whether uh, uh, where there might be a, a, like a subsurface ocean and how deep it might be and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, there's a few more questions, but I'd like for the students in the class to go ahead and ask another. Um, so think about that for a second. Um, and uh, there's a question from Sam Rappaport. Um, what do you see? What is the limiting factor on mission lifetime? So that one's pretty uh, uh, easy. Uh, so go ahead, Zibi, please. Go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. That's fine. You got it. Um, the uh, uh, the MMRTG um, is is the limiting factor. The um, we rely not only on the MMRTG for power, of course, but we're relying on the heat from the MMRTG, and, and of course, with the plutonium, eventually put uh, in terms of power and uh, the um, and and heat from the MMRTG uh, will not uh, um, be able to keep us warm on the surface. Uh, so it depends a lot on some of the specific implementation and the timing, um, but the, the lifetime uh, limit, the, the limit on the lifetime from the MMRTG is likely to be several years. Uh, so we have margin uh, on our nominal mission plan with, with that, of course, um, but but that's ultimately what will will limit the the lifetime of Dragonfly on the surface of Titan. Thank you. Um, and then uh, does Dragonfly have to land on flat surfaces, or does the suspension allow it to land uh, stabilized, or to stabilize for drilling on even on uneven terrain? And does it have its own landing gear? analogous to the other, uh, like the rover, sorry, like the Curiosity rocker system? So <clears throat> the that's a good question. Um, the the answer is that uh, we actually, we carry a requirement, um, and, and this was something we thought was reasonable, that, that we land, be able to land on up to a 10 degree slope with quarter meter tall, AKA half meter diameter hemispherical obstacles. Those obstacles can be uh, above or below. You know, they can be depressions uh, or they can be bulges on the surface. Um, 
the the question of sampling is interesting because we, we also have to support and there are requirements we carry for um the uh the weight on bit for the the drills we have to the the, the weight of the the lander now having low gravity is great for flying right you know it makes it easy to get off the surface and fly but then when you try to press on a built drill bit it's not so good because you don't weigh very much and you can actually jack up the lander if you don't have enough weight on on the bit to to drill so uh the drills are hammer drills which help because the of course you have an impulsive load for a very short period of time very high force to help you dig into the ground um but the attitude of the lander to the last question or the last part of the question is um is a player in that too because if you if you have a an uneven landing site uh then that affects your ability to put weight on bit you know the left front drill, for instance, might be light, whereas the right front is heavy. And that'll be part of our landing site assessment when we decide which drill to use. Um, the landing gear itself, uh, the way we um, architected it in the concept study report, the, the, uh, the big report that we submitted to NASA, was that the landing gear was articulated. So the, the, there are four pneumatic dampers. We didn't talk about this, but we use, because we have to make uh, at least 40 landings, um, we use a pneumatic system, a pneumatic damper system to absorb impact when we land on the ground. We didn't want a rigid system because the, the, that could lead to um, very high loads when you land because uh, we don't really know for certain what we're going to land on. We would like to land on ice, for instance, which is very hard. Of course, as we've described or Zibby's described, um, we plan to land in these uh, sand dunes, these hydrocarbon sand dunes, which could be very soft. So we use this uh, pneumatic system, pneumatic damper system to account for the uncertainty of the surface and the uncertainty in the um, topography of the surface. And again, they're articulated to handle that. So that's the plan. So it's sort of like what's on uh, the, the Curiosity rover that has a rocket bogey system um, that are coupled. So the, the six wheels all you know, actually, well, it's a little complicated to describe over the over this medium but uh the, the deal there is that that it, it's it's uh architected to handle all sorts of terrain as it drives we have a similar system uh in the sense that we have uh, this articulation in in our gear to account for the terrain uncertainty let's see checking on questions um i think we've covered most of these um Yeah, okay. Um, are there any more questions from the from the students in the class? I maybe have a, a naive question. Um, so during the presentation last night, Dr. Turtle mentioned um, that at nighttime, you may be able to detect organics by fluores UV fluorescence. And I'm just kind of curious, is there, if you can use UV fluorescence in a similar way that you could use like infrared spectroscopy to identify maybe what, other than maybe like the mass spec methods to identify the organics, could you use fluorescence to maybe cross correlate that in some way, or are they just sort of all fluorescing in a similar way? Uh, different materials do fluoresce differently, um, and I could try to pull up the image, but but you do see different colors from different materials. I don't know that it's um, that it's unique enough to you know in a way that would allow us to specifically identify individual materials based on you know what we're seeing with the cameras. Um, but by correlating that with the measurements that DRAMS makes of the the surface materials, we might get a you know we might be able to um, infer that if something glows kind of green, it, it's likely to be, you know, what one of the materials that, that uh, DRAM samples, or if it glows blue, it's likely to be another. So I think we'll be able to do some, well, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to do some uh, kind of high-level correlation, uh, but I don't think it would be as diagnostic. Um, we don't have the, you know, the very high spectral resolution, and, and uh, it may not be. Uh, sufficient in that sense to actually identify them without ingesting materials into the uh, mass spectrometer. Great, thank you. 
I have a, a, a maybe quick question. Um, uh, so you guys use uh, gamma ray and neutron spectrometer to look at composition of the surface. Is there, I just was curious, and you may have already covered this, but is there a reason why you like didn't use Raman to look at surface composition under the, the lander? Do you want me to? Um, yeah, if you if you want, uh, Melissa, uh, go ahead. Sure. This this question is um, it's a great question. It kind of goes back to the earlier question: is what do you wish you could include? What did you have to pick off? Um, we we went through and considered a lot of different ideas when we were beginning to to put the payload together. And uh, Raman was one of the ones uh, that we considered, um, but. One of the reasons that we, for example, are, are um, using the the approach of dragons, the gamma ray neutron uh, spectrometers, it really gives us a, an idea of this whole area around the lander. We get this immediate sense of what are we sitting on, and and we get that sense shortly after landing. I mean, it takes a while to you know integrate, but we can we can we can do that shortly after land, and it's really helpful for us because we're trying to identify different geologic units in part on like a, a slightly larger scale than than what you might observe with a with a small focused ramen and and so we get an idea of if we have layering if we have a layer maybe over ice or if we have ice that has a bunch of salt in it versus pure ice um, and, and we get that that for for that area all around all around the lander where it is. And so that feeds in part into a lot of the other investigations in addition to just sort of that, that surface, molecular surface composition investigation. Um, and then and then we accomplish the molecular investigation with the with the mass spectrometer. But I mean a, a Raman would be an excellent addition too, but it all comes back to hard choices and squeezing in a box. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a a follow-up question to that is so is the reason why you're looking like under the lander is that because you can't really look like that far away with that with dragons or like it, i guess i just was curious as to why it's just focused on like below the below the um the spacecraft right so the the way the approach works in general is um uh, put out neutrons from the pulse neutron generator, and it interacts with basically the whole area around, and then you get the signal back from from this radius around the lander. So it's not like a targeted um, approach where or where you can go really far away. So it's sort of about sensing the environment around where you know a whole radius around the detector. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last call on questions. Well, folks, this has just been fantastic. Um, thank you so much. I mean, we so we had we still have 44 people online, and we I think we were up over 50 at one point in time. So it's great. Um, it's been really really successful. Thank you so much for. Um, answering all the student questions and uh, from members of the public as well. Um, it's really been a pleasure to have you guys all here and um, uh, so excited for Dragonfly. I was at AbSycon uh, when the mission was announced and it was the most excited I have I have, I have been <laughs> except for when we found out Europa Clipper was going to happen finally and that our team got selected. So slightly selfish answer there, but it was... Uh, it was amazing, and I really, I, I'm so excited about it because I just think it represents everything that we should be doing. It's a, it's ambitious in every way, scientifically, engineering-wise, but it also rep represents, you know, something that I think is really important, which is the collaboration of engineering and science, um, which can often be a bit antagonistic in mission design processes. So I think it's 
It's really awesome. And it's the kind of thing that I, I think represents the frontier rather than the way we've always done business in the past. So congratulations to you guys as a team for accomplishing this really amazing work and can't wait to see what's happening. And yeah, as uh, Taylor was saying, we're all fangirling out here. Um, so thank you very much for, for spending time uh, with us today and uh, for making, uh, making time for it. And uh, best of luck. I'm sure you have uh, you'll have lots of applications, not so not so uh, distant future from folks that were on this call. So, yeah, thanks very thanks much, Brittany, um, and thanks to to everyone. I just wanted to thank for the the great questions and discussion. Uh, really glad to be able to join you virtually um, to to have to have the you know to have this conversation uh, and to be able to discuss so many you know wide ranging aspects of the of the system that is that is Dragonfly. So thank you. It's thank a perfect everyone. highlight. It is the perfect highlight because we have a mixture of engineering students and science students and this theme this semester's theme has been the mission process and instrument design and, and implementation as well because that's the kind of things that you don't usually hear in your in your science presentations and you don't in your engineering talks don't hear about how the engineering decisions and the science decisions play off each other to get this result so it was great melissa i think i cut you off sorry about that no no i was just i was just saying it, it's been awesome and i tried to help answer some more of the follow-up questions in the in the q a hopefully um hopefully that helps clear up any lingering questions <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everyone for an awesome semester. It's been a real pleasure. Um, a reminder to feel free to register for the Planetary and Astrobiology uh, seminar uh, next semester. We're going to be highlighting probably a bit more astrobiology uh, next time around. Um, we'll kind of alternate back and forth because it's going to be held with, uh, um, with the astrobiology uh, seminal papers class. So um, let's uh, Let's kind of give everyone a, a hand and have a safe break and take care of yourselves and your family. Thanks so much for uh, coming and participating. So um, we'll talk to you guys all later.